<clears throat> hey, Jimbo, you ready for this deal? Turn him out. <laughs> Old stories like long lost friends. Rodeos and late night bends. History before our time. Round pens and pasture rides. Cowboys of the Osage. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Cowboys of the Osage podcast. Really, the Cowboys of the Prairie Circuit podcast today. Yeah. Brought to you by the Ben Johnson Cowboy Museum, located in historic downtown Pahuska, Oklahoma, and the Buck and Flamingo Turquoise Shop, also located in historic downtown Pahuska, Oklahoma. It's old Cody over here. And as always, I have my main man with me, Mr. Rodeo Historian himself, probably wrote a song on the way down here, Jimbo Snively. Good to see you, Jimbo. Who do we have today? Hey, Cody boy, it's another great day in Osage, but we're not in Osage. Mm -mm. We're in Duncan, Oklahoma. We're in the Chisholm. At the Chisholm Trail Trail Heritage Center. Beautiful museum. If if you get down this way, be sure and check it out. It's so cool. Yeah, really. And uh, we're here for the Chisholm Trail Prairie Circuit Rodeo Living Legends in Duck D. It's right up there with the Ben Johnson Museum. Yeah, yeah. And and we've got uh, one of the living legends in Duck D's, Mr. John Macbeth. 1974 Saddle Bronc champion, and Mr. Hall of Fame, you might say. He's in the Cowboy Hall of Fame in OKC, the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame, the Kansas Rodeo Hall of Fame, and now he's a living legend. So I don't know what's left for him to to get in, but he probably will. Probably something. He'll probably get in the Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> he <somewhere>. might. <laughs> and we got Mike Anderson with us, our buddy Mike Anderson. So, I yeah. hope you got your rodeo history pencil sharpened today because, Mike, he's quite the rodeo historian I know himself, it. Jimbo. Yeah. John, Mike, welcome to the Cowboys of Osage podcast. Thank you. Thank you. John, how does it feel to be a living legend? You know, when I started out this deal, I didn't dream anything like this was ever possible. But thank the good Lord, I guess I'm a living legend. You are. That's what they told me today. Yeah. And I'm really grateful. I don't think we'll ever be living legends, Cody. In Japan, maybe. <laughs> In Japan. We always have that, Jimbo. Yeah, yeah. You were raised in Kansas, John, right? Yes, sir. A little place called Kingman, Kansas. Yeah. Went through high school, graduated there. Kingman? Kingman, Kansas. I didn't know you were originally from Kingman. Yes, that's where I'm from. You lived in Hutchinson for a while. I did, I did. I got in a fight in Kingman with a whole group of guys one time. (laughs) Uh, in, in, that strange, in the gas station the parking thing. lot. Isn't that strange? I did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys from Kingman and Hutchison, I hope it we the showed up in Kingman and it was a fight just about every time. <laughs> That's good, John. <Well>, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of good cowboys from Kansas, but you were the first, I think, the first world champion since way back in the 40s with those Roberts brothers. Yeah, the Roberts were both world champions yeah. before before I was. But that's quite a um, dry spell there for Ken Kansas. and Gerald. And Gerald gave me a bit of advice when I started. Uh-huh. It's been with me every, every day since. Right. And that was probably in the late 50s. Right. He simply told me, spur one jump higher, or spur one inch higher every jump. Right. I'll get it straight in a minute, but the but the message was good. Right, right. And that stuck with you, huh? That's what we do. That that worked in riding bucking horses, and it worked in life. Right. Always striving to be just a little bit better each jump. Whatever. That is, that is good. What were those guys from in Kansas? I never really heard of them. Strong City, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Strong City, Kansas. Ken, Ken Roberts, he was uh, two-time... Bull riding Bull champion ride. of the world in the 40s. Wow. And Gerald was the all-around, I think, in 48. And you're testing my memory now, but I think that's right. He's Joel. quite the rodeo historian himself. I forgot, you weren't you the president of the Rodeo Histo- Historical Society for quite some time? Uh, two year, I did a two-year term, yes, sir. 
I pretty much don't know nothing sitting over here oh. about anything. I got three That's of the best another experience sitting right here in front of me. I'm a little, I'm a little starstruck right now, Jimbo. Your dad was a bulldog and cab roper and stuff. My dad time was event. a timey, yep, yeah, a timed event. And man. you went rough stall. Why was why is that? Well, when I was about 15, I told my dad I wanted to go rodeoing, and he looked at me with that strange look in his eye, and he said, "What do you want to do?" He'd had me roping calves with him since I was about 13 years old. And I said, well, I'm probably never going to be big enough to handle cattle well enough to beat anybody. You know, so I'm probably going to have to be a rider. He said, um, well, he thought for a minute and he said, now those bareback horses, he said, they, they, they're probably all right. You're just holding on to that one little thing with your hand. And that, you know, I, I could probably condone that. But now those saddle broncs, he said, those stirrups are mighty small. He said, they worry me to death. <laughs> Afraid you'd hang up. And I've seen him ride some bad suckers in a set of lace up brogans. Yeah. Lots of them. And, and, and he, he looked at me kind of funny again and he said, now, I've got a question. You and I live on a ranch, farm, whatever. We got, we've got cows. And every once in a while, we have to hire some help to work these cattle, right? Yeah. He said, would you hire some old boy if he rode up here on a bull wanting a job? And I kind of grinned and giggled, and I said, no, probably not. He said, well, why not? I said, because he's probably crazier than a bed bug. <laughs> he said, that's my point, exactly. <laughs> so you never got on any bulls? Oh, I never said that. <laughs> you were crazier than a bed bug, didn't you? I never, got very many, I never got on very many around him. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I went to school in McNeese in, in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and there was a, a local stock contractor, a, a pair of brothers, that had an arena very close and we'd go out there on Sunday and try out bareback horses and bulls and it's been a long time ago so maybe the whole world doesn't even know about the Kenny brothers anymore yeah but they had some bulls mister and they probably are responsible or partly responsible for my confidence and be able to do the things that I did they bought out a, a stock contractor in South Dakota in Nemo, South Dakota, at the first national finals in 1959. That's the year that I went to McNeese in Lake Charles to go to college. And I had grades enough, you know, when the, the college rodeo rolled around in February of 1960, I had grades enough, so I entered. Bareback riding and the saddle bronc riding. Not much happened in the bronc riding there, but in the bareback riding, I drew a horse called Little Stranger. And he had just been through the first national finals, been out twice with two zeros. And I don't even remember who had him. I guess it's not significant. But I won, or I split the bareback riding with another friend on that horse. And just, just from a little 19-year-old kid that comes up with a horse like that, and comes out with a result like that, I thought, look out world, here I come. Boy, what a lesson I had. Yeah. <laughs> and what I got later. Right, right. <laughs> you told us one time about getting on a bunch of Bronx for for the Roberts or something up in Kansas. Yeah, I yeah. did. Is that how you practice? I always wondered how rust off people practice. You know, without getting killed or yeah, just every day like, if you're yeah. a roper, you're out there yeah, breaking breaking or away or yeah. exercising your horse and this or that, or about a million other things. Shoeing them. Me. Yeah. Those yeah, Roberts I, that we mentioned earlier uh -huh. lived in Strong City, Kansas, right. in the Flint Hills. Right. Big grass country. Right. And every spring, late March, early April, they'd bring everything they had in to the rodeo arena in Strong City. And they'd buck them all out, and they'd pay the sky is to get on. I think we got five dollars to get on a bareback horse and seven fifty to get on a bronc. 
and there wasn't any rodeos going on in Kansas that early in the year. So everybody showed up to the spring buckout. And the reason they did that was they wanted to know what was going to be on the A team and what was going to be on the B team and what was going to stay home in the pasture and what was going to that other place. And uh, that day, I had a little help, you know, packing saddles and bareback riggings from the from the unrigging chute back to the other chute, and I got on 27 head in one day. Now, don't ask me about the next day. Yeah. Sore. You were young and tough, though, then, too. Yeah. Good thing, wasn't it? Yeah, good thing. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't guessing. get on 27 more the next day? Would I have? <laughs> Probably, but it might have been a different result. <laughs> Holy moly. Wow, that's a lot of Bronx. That is a lot of Bronx to be it getting is. on. Did they all buck pretty good, or some of them just so-so? Or? You know what? I don't remember. Yeah. Some of them sure did. Yeah. Some of them sure did. Yeah. And we went to some of their rodeos, you know, early in my career, probably as a permit holder. Yeah. Um, they sold out in 61, I think. Yeah. And went to their sale in Salina, Kansas, and watched – those guys get on Jesse James and everything, you know. Yeah. That was kind of a I – I remember at that sale, Roy Rodewald got on him when they sold him, and he rammed his forehead into the headache bar, knocked him cold on a wedge. And I'm thinking, good grief, I hope I don't ever have to get on that rascal. <laughs> Seven times later. Well, Marvin Paul was telling us out there at the rodeo grounds earlier that he, he'd get on a lot of those tough bulls before he'd get on some of them Bronx and big old Bronx. That he said, them suckers look at you before you even get on them. You'll roll that eye at you. And <laughs> he said you work. couldn't pour him on one. I know. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> but them guys that can ride Bronx, and I'm sure you're that way, John, you could make it look so easy when you got tapped off. It's just like you're sitting in your living room in a rocking chair or something. I know it's not that easy, but. Well, I've heard that a time. That has to feel good, though, doesn't it, when yeah, you're tapped off does. like that? it does. But I'm here to tell you they're not all easy. Oh, I know they're not. But but you all, a good rock rider can make them look easy sometimes. Yeah, that's... that's. Can you make one look so easy you don't get a score? That's happened, too. I wrote Descent one time for nothing. Really? He said he didn't buck. <laughs> I didn't think so. I mean, I sure, I sure <laughs> thought he did, but... <laughs> they didn't ask you, did they? <laughs> no. Wow. Well, there's probably no way to probably make the, the rough stock ride real fair for everybody ever, is there? Is there a way to do it? I don't know. Do all those calves weigh the same pound for pound? Well, they're supposed to weigh in the same range, but they probably don't. The same range. That's still quite a bit of difference. Yes, sir. Some kick and some don't. That's well, right. you know, when I was roping, there was only in a pen of steers, or there was only a few that you could probably win the round on. Yeah. It's probably the same in the rough stock. You know, back in the day, an East Stone contractor had, I don't know, a few. You know, sometimes it was one or two. Sometimes it was a dozen. Good animals, the ones that you wanted to draw. And uh, sometimes the announcer helped a little bit, you know. Yeah. Sometimes he was uh, worked the other way. When did, they, when did they stop drawing your stock at the rodeo and letting you guys know? Before you got there, what what you had, John? Because that had to change uh, yeah, the game quite a 70s, bit. Yeah, late '70s, probably mid '70s, um, when Procom came in to start with. They um, they told us that the computer drew them, but actually, what I think happened, you know, and this is just my opinion, is that each contractor send in the list of horses that he wanted to buck or bulls at that particular performance and had every performance at that rodeo listed already. And the computer probably had everybody drawn up, positions drawn. And if you were the first guy up the first performance and the stock contractor, whoever he might be, sent in his list for that first performance, the first horse on his list was the one you had. It didn't take long to figure that out, you know. So they they made a few changes here and there. I, I don't know that it's 
better or worse, you know, I'm probably not the one to ask about that. Well, it's probably, I don't know. I was just wondering because now if you draw something you can't win on or something that don't, you don't want to get on, you just don't go. But back then, did they actually draw the horses at the rodeo the day of the rodeo? Sometimes. Sometimes. It depends on the stock contractor. It depends on whether you were at a match bronc riding or match roping or whatever. You know, they're going to draw them right then. When Bobby Berger and I had a match at Burden, Kansas in 1969, we each got on five horses in an hour and a half. And they, when they loaded them, we stood out in front of the chutes and drew which one of us had which horse. And that would test your endurance, I'm telling you. Thankfully, they brought a dozen really good horses, two re-rides, and the, the, the deal kind of went from relatively easy horses and it got progressively a little deeper. My last one was Jesse James. And thankfully, I got him rode and won the match. But it was it was a fight. Before that round, I was three points behind on forehead. Where'd y'all have the match at? Burden, Kansas. Burden, Kansas. Yeah. Holy moly. You don't see too many bronc riding matches anymore. No, you don't. I, I think well, they, the, it seems like the, the standalone uh, extreme bronx, they call those match bronc rides, but yeah. to me it's against two guys what a match would be. Yeah, that's what I would – I mean, that's the way I learned it. Um, times change, I guess. You know, over there at the Guyman Rodeo for years, Jimbo, for years and years and years when I would go, whoever won the performance that night at the rodeo in, in Guyman had to match one of the Etbauer brothers – for an extra bonus money. Didn't count for the rodeo, but if you won the performance that night, you got to match. And I don't know, it was just a random draw who it was. It was Dan or or Billy or Robert or Craig Latham, one of those four guys. The winner of the uh, perf would get to go match those guys, I think, for $1,500. Who put up the money? Uh, That big ranch that's out there. Hitch oh. Ranch, I believe, probably <laughs> put Hitch, the money yeah. up. I think that's who put the money up. Whoever whoever won that rodeo better bring his red and breeches to that match. You got that right. Yeah, I think you know if one of those guys stayed on, they the other guy didn't win the match. It didn't seem like but. those guys. I remember the very first time I ever saw the Ed Bowers. I had a pretty much an annual bronc riding school in on out of South Dakota for almost thirty years. In one year, these two poor kids drove up in an old international pickup and started dragging out their old bronc saddles. And I'm telling you, these boys had breeches on that had patches on patches. Their patches were patched. A patch on a patch. And they, uh, the, the oldest one, would visit just a little. And he'd answer your questions. The younger one, who was 14 at the time, didn't say one word the whole time. I found out their name was Robert and Billy. And every morning they were a little bit late. And every evening they'd leave a little bit early. In South Dakota in June, it might still be daylight at 10 o'clock. And they'd show up the next morning, late as usual. And I asked them one time, I said, um, and you know, I bet you guys had to save money a long time to get to come to this school. And Robert says, oh, yeah, we did. I said, you know what? Are you learning anything? Oh, yeah. I said, well, why are you late every morning and why do you leave early every evening? He said, it's 90 miles to Reheights down a dirt road. And he said, we got chores to do before we come and when we get home. I said, well, why didn't you make arrangements for somebody to do those chores for you for these four or five days? He said, well, we're all that's there, and Grandpa, and he's up in his 80s. He just tells <laughs> us what to do, and we do it. Yeah. So they had a pretty good 16, work, work ethic 16. after all, you know, and you thought they didn't maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, they are probably the utmost – 
success story in the in the in the sport of the rodeo or the history of the sport of the rodeo. Right. Yeah. And Danny came along later, but he's you got to include him. He's, he dang, he came dang close to winning a world title two or three times. Yeah. As yeah. close as someone could come to not winning one. Yeah, that's true. Well, I don't know. Well, another one of my students lost one one time to five dollars and twenty eight cents to Bobby Berger. Wow. <laughs> well, that might be about as close. This guy's yeah, name was sure. Tom Miller, Tom C. Miller in South Dakota, and, I, and, and I, what a tremendous bronc rider he was. I've been blessed. I've had some great students. Why do so many good bronc riders come from the Dakotas? Why do so many of them? Yes, sir. It's a long ways to the house if you fall off. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> you've been in that country. You've seen, you know, the towns might be 100 miles apart. Yeah. They're yes, not sir. all that way, but yeah. some of them in western South Dakota. Are it ain't sure like along. Kansas where there's a town every five miles or so. Well, about every 30, where I grew up anyhow. Yes, sir. Yeah, eastern Kansas, they get a little closer. Western, they're they're a little spread out, but yeah, yeah. Last time we talked to you, John, we didn't even mention your book. Tell us about your book. Well, that all kind of happened. Eight seconds of grace, the story of John McBain. One day, and you can get it on Amazon. One day, when I picked up the mail, I lived in Kansas yet. Mm -hmm. There was a book in there from a guy by the name of Thad Berry. And I remembered that name. Thad had been to my school. And inside the front cover was a note on another piece of paper written by Thad Berry. He said, read Bronx School. This is about my experience at your Bronx School and told me when it was. And I read through that book, and it was real well written. Um probably 25 stories in it that were good reading. So I just called him, had his phone number on the back of the book. And I said, uh, I really enjoyed this book. I said, are you going to write another one? He said, I've about run out of stories. He said, I wish I knew where I could find some more. And then he stopped for a minute and he said, wait a minute. He said, would you uh, tell me some of those stories of yours? Yeah. So one time during a meeting in Pueblo or Colorado Springs, I can't remember just which, it was a Little Bridges uh, Rodeo Committee meeting, and my son was on it, so I drove out there with him, and Thad was from Colorado originally. He drove down, and we spent all afternoon on a, a, a tape recorder telling him stories, and he'd go home and write them one at a time and send them to me one at a time. And we, between the two of us, we would do the editing, mm -hmm. and then he'd stow it away. And we, I think there's 32 stories in that book. It's quite a process to get them done. It's not just sit down at the kitchen table and start writing. Right, it, right. it doesn't work that way. Or to it do it right, me. yeah. Well, what are they about? Just your time on the rodeo trail, or? Ah, uh, yeah. Sometimes there's, there's stories about my my kids and uh, and my students. Yeah. Some of them, you know, and then there was a lot of them. Right. Just experiences at the school or on the road or people, you know. There's a story in there about friends in high places. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> One year I got a, I was making a, a spring run, thank you, and uh, went to California, went to Vegas. First one was in Vegas, and I see Mac Baldridge there, and this is like Wednesday afternoon, and I know Mac's entered there, and I don't know where else, so I just went up and asked him. I, I knew him vaguely, not, not as a great friend. And uh, we got to be that way later, but I just asked him, you know, if he was, he, he lived in Connecticut, and he had pilots that flew a company jet for him. And that's how he got to and from rodeos on the West Coast. And he said, yeah, we're here. He said, it's parked, the plane's parked in Sacramento, and we're leaving uh, Sunday morning 
we could, would like to leave Saturday evening and go back. I, he said, why are you asking? I said, because I need to be in Cherokee, Iowa, Monday, Memorial Day. He said, we'll make that happen. So we did. And on the way, um, Mac and his wife and his daughter and my wife and I, hitchhiking on a private jet now, putting that one on for class. Anyhow, the, the co-pilot comes back, just comes walking back through the cabin door and pours himself a cup of coffee. And I looked at Mac and I said, uh, you suppose I could go look in the cabin? He said, well, yeah, he's going to have coffee. He said, just go up there and tell the, tell the pilot what you want to do. <laughs> so I walked up there and told him, and he said, well, sit down. So I'm all of a sudden in the co-pilot's seat of a DH-125, which is a, a, a medium-sized corporate jet. Uh, and uh, pretty soon this pilot looks at me and he said, uh, how many hours you got? I said, oh, I don't know, 13, 14, 1,500. I really haven't counted them for a while. He said, why don't you just, uh, he said he'd been through, you know, the, the ins and outs of flying a particular jet. It was trimmed out. We were about 40,000 feet, and we had a tremendous tailwind. And he said, I'm going to go get coffee. He walked back there, and all of a sudden, I'm the only one in the cabin. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked back, and, you know, when I got, they came back finally, you know, and I walked back in there, and Max said, I asked him who was flying this airplane. <laughs> I said, you know, I think the machine was flying itself. I was just lucky enough to go sit in the, in the, uh -huh. in the seat. Yeah, in the, in, the, in the pilot seat, or the co pilot seat as it was. And uh, Mac and I got to be tremendous friends. You know, I really miss that guy. He had yeah. a tremendous mind. And he could rope pretty good, too. He was uh, President Reagan's Secretary of Commerce. And he got killed in a team roping accident. Got in a corner and a horse flipped on him and drove a saddle horn through him. It just didn't work. But a great guy. Yeah. And, you know, there's, that's just one of the stories. Yeah, right. There's a lot of them. You, you didn't show it. I call it my bathroom book because the stories are about the right length. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm going to get it. I, saw, I ran across it the other day. That's the only time I read, John. That's going to be perfect. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help you. I didn't even know you could read. Oh, Sean Williams, our buddy Sean, you know Jimbo? Right, right. Pearl, he, Pearl Snap. His bathroom book, it, he said that the pages on it are uh, good toilet paper, too. He had it, he had it specially made. Only heal. That's Only too much heal. information, Coach. I'm working on Thad to do another one. I don't know how well that's going to work, but we're we're giving it a try. I got something I've been wanting to ask you, John. The other day, for some reason, you and I talk quite regular every month or so, it seems like. And uh, I told you we were fixing to talk to old Ralph Maynard. And you said, ask him who taught him how to win. Did he tell you? He told me. <laughs> What's that mean, though? I want to know how to win. So does everybody else watching this. It, it is, well, it's a short story, I can tell you. I've been quite a few miles with Ralph's older brother, Gene. And Gene called one time, you know, and he was, he was going back to the IRA way, or IPRA, whatever it is now. And I was going to the RCA. And I was still amateur, and but I was, you know, he knew where I was going. And he said, uh, my little brother goes and rodeos with Lyle and I. That was his other brother. And he said, uh, we win, you know, both of us. And Ralph just kind of goes along. He knows he's probably not going to have to drive, not going to worry about where the gas money comes from or when he's going to get to eat next. And he said, uh, he'll ride four or five jumps and look over one side or the other and just bail off. He said, I need for you to take him, get him away from us, and teach him something. So the first rodeo we go to was in Council Grove, Kansas. 
And I mentioned a while ago that the Roberts had sold out. At that particular sale, this stock contractor that was putting on this amateur rodeo had bought an old bad sucker at that sale because he was cheap. It was a horse called Spanish Fort. And I remembered the horse. And I told Ralph when he's getting on him, I said, don't look off. Sit down straight. Keep the weight and the both stirrups the same. If you ever look off, this guy's going to turn you a chili. He'll come away from you and then come back and get you. And you're going to think it's all all real good. And then he goes the other way, the same, the same way the second time. He said, I've seen him cow kill lots of them doing that. Sit down and ride. Well, Ralph wins the bronc riding. And I just told him, you know, we had that was Saturday night. It was over. And he won... Uh, a big cooler and two pair of jeans and a, a few dollars and I don't know what all. But nothing was open in that town on Sunday, so we got to stay Monday to pick up all of his loot. And on the way home, I said, well, I hope you're happy now. He said, well, yeah, I'm happy. I said, because the rest of this summer, we're going to win first and second, and it's my turn. <laughs> and, you know, really, that, that just about happened. We just about swapped off every, every rodeo or every other rodeo. Each one of us would win something. And I guess that's how I taught him to win. That one horse really, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, it didn't take much to teach him how to win. Guy, He's a talented individual and a pretty good guy. Yeah, seems like a great guy. Yeah, he is. He's a good guy to me, for sure. Yeah, he, he was... Uh, he was a good guy, and Gene was a good guy, and and you probably never heard of Lyle Maynard, but he was a really good guy. He stayed in South Dakota and never, never really left. You know, raised bucking horses. John, I don't know how many times uh, people will tell us, or I've read it somewhere, or they've told us on how much you helped them. The guy just sitting in your chair, Lyle Sankey, you know, Ralph Maynard, and I don't know how many times I've read that that you were a big influence in their career. That must make you feel good, I guess. Jimbo, the, when I started, people were pretty pretty closed-mouthed. Right. You start riding Bronx in Kansas, in the first place, there's not that many riders to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ones that were there and the ones that were winning weren't really willing to share with a kid. Right. Most of them, you know, right. not all of them, right. I'm sure, but most of them. And early on, I decided that if I ever got to where I could win, I wasn't going to be like that. Uh, Gerald Roberts was the first and only one for many years to give me any information. Ken was a good, good fellow, fun to be around. Uh, but he never told me anything, you know, how to play pitch maybe. Right. <laughs> but uh, not about riding bucking horses. Right. And, and, you know, if you can help somebody that needs help, why not? Yeah. You know, if they're going to enter, that's more money in the pot. Right. Go. If you're lucky enough to win it, fine. If they are, good for them. Yeah. I just got lucky. Yeah, I don't know about talent. that. I've heard that about you probably more than anybody else, that, that they gave you credit for helping. I'm pretty proud of my students. I've got eight or ten of them in Hall of Fames everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mike, explain <clears throat> the thought process into getting John into the Living Legends. It wasn't much of a thought process. I just – It was uh, a no-brainer, wasn't it? It was a no-brainer. <laughs> he was on my radar for uh, three or four years. I just didn't know how to get in touch with him, and I called Bronk. And I asked Bronk, I said, I need to know how to get a hold of John Macbeth. And uh, he gave me a number. And uh, we, were, we try to keep our, our legends. We've got calf ropers, we've got barrel racers, you know, we've got different things. We try to not mix a barrel racer with a Bronk rider. We try to keep them together. And there's no reason for that, really, because all of them are friends anyway. John's got many barrel racer and calf roper friends. We've talked about that. 
but that's what we've done. So we waited until we could get uh, some bronc riders together and bull riders and whatever, and that's what we did this year. And uh, like I said, Doug Clark uh, we was having lunch, and uh, he said, well, what are we going to do this year? Who are we going to get? And I said, well, I want John Macbeth. And uh, he, I said, who's on your radar? And he said, well, Ronnie Bowman. And I said, I didn't even know Ronnie was still around. So I said, who's the other one? And he said, what about Lyle Sankey? And I said, I thought he up in the Northwest. No, that's Ike. That's a different one. This one is in Kansas, and he rodeoed in Kansas. So that's how it all came about. And then when I got in touch with uh, – John, he, he basically gave me other phone numbers for the different ones, you know, so yeah. I called them up, and except for Lyle. And uh, we didn't have any number for Lyle. And then one of our other committee members, Jim McLean, I ran into him at a bull fraternity at yeah. the same arena where we're at today. And uh, I said, I need to get in touch with Lyle. So I got Lyle on the phone. Jim had his number. I got a Lyle on the phone, and he said, "Who's the other legends?" And I told him. He said, "He is my hero." Yeah. He's he's the one that made me want to be what I am. And he said, "Is he going to be there?" And I said, "He says he is." And he says, "I'll be there," he, just for that, just to get to see him again. Yeah. So, yeah, he's a big influence on everybody, pretty much. I don't know about the Bulldoggers and all that. <laughs> well, you know, they, were, they were pretty them. good friends, a couple, three of them, four. <laughs> have Maybe good, those two Duvals, but they were good friends to have. They're, they're good folks, all hey, of them. John, this is the, uh, the Prairie Circuit Living Legends. You're getting inducted in here. There's some people, believe it or not, that don't know what the Prairie Circuit is or maybe even the circuit system is in professional rodeo. You were probably there when they invented it. I was the first secretary for about 10 years. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Could you give us just kind of a brief explanation what the Prairie Circuit is? Yes, sir. In the beginning, the national finals was doing relatively well. But... It was only benefiting people that rodeoed full time. And there was a lot of guys with other responsibilities they owned or leased or whatever, you know, from a ranch down to any kind of a, a business. Maybe they run a bunch of cows and they couldn't be gone that long. Uh, maybe, they, maybe they were Foolish responsibilities. They, they but, aren't paying attention to rodeo. Yeah, their, their own responsibilities kept them from rodeoing full time. So we needed something else to compensate, if you will, for those people. And Larry Jordan came up with a thought or a plan to break the United States up into 12 different sections, particularly for those kind of people. And he searched around, and, you know, like the Kansas and Nebraska uh, and Oklahoma area, he just called it the Prairie Circuit because that's what we are. It's a, we're, we're Prairie States. And he put California all by itself, put Texas all by itself. The eastern area, pretty much east of the Mississippi, is all an area by itself. Maybe Florida. I mean, it's part of that one. I don't know, 12 different ones. And he called me, I'm going to say May or June of 1975. He said, I need somebody to kind of back this deal. It's brand new. He said, I know you're not going to be rodeoing as hard as you once did. Would you Would you take it? And I'm, I'm here to tell you it wasn't fun selling those first four, five, or six years. I finally convinced a, 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 a civic group in Wichita, Kansas, a group called the Wagon Masters. And I sat down with some of their leaders and told them what I'd like to do. Kansas Coliseum was new, and they uh, 
they excused herself for a few minutes and came back and they said, we're going to, we're interested up to a hundred thousand. We'll underwrite you for a hundred thousand, put it on. And we got to Kansas Coliseum. That was part of it because of their influence in that town. And unknowingly, we interrupted somebody else's plans for a big rodeo in Kansas Coliseum, which is another story. Of, of, but we had four years of great rodeos, added a lot of money. We started in 1978 with 4,500 an event, which was unheard of at the time. Only one other... Circuit finals came close, and that was Texas. And uh, we did it for four years, and the wagon masters decided to go another route. We lost Wichita. I had another man who used to be a producer, announcer, lived in Kansas, and he was sickly older at the time, sickly, and he he told us, just do it, I'll, I'll, I'll finance it. But about that time, somebody else had other plans, you know, for the circuit to go a different direction. And I, I spent my 10 years, I thought I was productive, so I've had it. And during that particular period, I won six of them, so I was I was pretty yeah pretty happy about it. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> well, they're doing a fine job of it down here in Duncan. It seems. Oh, like. they are. They really they picked are. that torch up and ran with it. I think it's found a home. They've got great sponsors, um, great people. You know, the year before they got it here, it was homeless. They didn't even have anywhere to have it in Old Weatherford, Oklahoma. They picked it up, the rodeo team, and just put it on yep. be- because. Uh, I think Bronk asked him to, and then, luckily, well, that was Mike of, moved it down here to. It was one thing about the wagon masters, and, and most people don't. Maybe they know and just don't realize, but in the contract with the wagon masters, the circuit was to get forty percent of the profit, and I don't think that's ever been duplicated in any circuit, anywhere, at any time. And they would, if it was four cowboys, do it. Help them. I mean, that's – if you make it bonuses, that's fine. If you want to add more money, that's fine. But get it to the cowboys, my friends. You cannot have a puppet show without puppets. That's right. And it just won't work. So if they're going to come and do it for you, with you, along with you, help them. They'll help you back. They're a loyal bunch of guys. That's they no are. doubt about it. They are. No doubt and about gals. it. And gals. And gals. Yeah. No doubt about it. They do have the girls here, too. <laughs> Breakaway roping. Lots of exciting things happening. Lots of money to be won in rodeo right now. Oh, my, my. Wouldn't I love to be one of them now? I'm sure you put yeah. all the pencil paper together. You probably would have won $230,000 last time you made the finals. In 1974, I left there with a lot of money, I thought at the time. Cows were cheap. I could go buy 100 head of cows with what I brought home from the finals in my hand. Wow. And where I lived was commercial pasture country. All those old ranchers I went to, said, son, you need to look around. This is commercial pasture country, yearling country. We only grass cattle from spring till fall. There's no room around here for a cow-calf operation. The only thing you could ask could be any worse would be a bunch of dadgum horses. Now, guess what's on all that grass country right now? <laughs> All those dead gun horses. There you are. All over that place. But if I'd have done that, all my my intelligence, I could have put them in a feedlot for 30 days and doubled my money. 
just didn't. Can you imagine cattle being a nickel a pound? Well, they were. Yeah. And with all that money I brought home, if you, you can almost win that much in one round at the finals yeah. right now. Yeah. And that year I set a $10,000 record for higher earnings for the bronc riding. From 1974 to this particular year, that value has increased 80% through the figures. Quite That's a bit really of money. Mm-hmm. That's quite a bit of money. Yes, it yep. is. That $40,000 would now be almost 200000 Yeah. So, yeah, you'd like to it's a different be 20 world. years old again and... Know what worried you know about where, where you were going to enter next and how you were going to get there and what you drew and how well you could ride. Yeah. Boy, Horrible. howdy, John. I want to thank you for being such a great world champion, taking time out of your day to help other people that need help. You got some questions about the sport, helping it grow. You've been involved uh, in every facet of rodeo, it seems like. You were the secretary for the, for the circuit system. Mm-hmm. You've been the president of the – Rodeo Historical Society, it just seems like everything and everybody you know came from rodeo, but you're giving right back to it, all you can. It's been good to me. Why not give it back? For sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Ditto on that. Well, you got anything else for him, Jimbo? If you're making a Mount Rushmore Bronx, who would you put on it? Need four Bronx. You need to get a bigger mountain. The biggest. No, you're going to do four. The worst Bronx there was. (laughs) Or the best. Or the best, or what it just in my time. Well, it doesn't even have to be your time. Wherever. Any time. Any time. I can only tell you about the ones I saw or the ones okay. I got on. That's it. There were some bad cats. And there were some really good ones. Um, I remember when Rodeos Incorporated bought the first load of two horses. They brought some that hadn't been ridden. And what a shock it was. But I'd like to thank Rodeos Incorporated. That happened early in my career. And what it taught me about riding Bronx. You, know, you get to get on things like Ecolaca, Sunset Strip, uh, Major Reno, Sheep Mountain. Those horses bucked now. And they weren't really the nicest ones in the country to ride. But you know what? If you're in a pen of horses like that, they still pay money to ride one and ride him well. But what I learned on those kind of horses were a great help later, you know, when you start going to bigger rodeos. You know, when you get to the big ones, it's, I remember one year, well, it's 1973 at Albuquerque. We got three. And Survey brought a bunch of new horses that nobody had ever seen before. And my dad taught me a long time ago. He said, you can tell about these horses where they're going to carry their head if you're going to ride Bronx by the way they're built. So I kind of quit asking people. And they bring this little square bear in, you know, and he's got a little short neck and a big wide back, and he's uh, probably going to weigh 13, 13, 50. Quarter horse built, and a little, I mean, a square, strong guy. And I'm thinking, if you try to sit down and take a hold of this guy, it ain't going to be fun. I won third in the round on one called Mr. Bratsman. And, and that story in itself won't carry any water. But years and years later, I entered Sydney, Nebraska. And there was a bunch of bronc riders that I didn't know. You know, I'm, I'm up well into my 40s by that time. And after the bronc riding, you go back to the, to the unrigging pen to pick up your saddle and your rein and all your equipment. And there was a young man back there that I didn't know. And the pickup man, Larry Kane, came in there and he's taking buck reins off of the company halters, you know, so he can put them back in the tack trunk. And this young man asked, Mr. Kane, what can you tell me about Mr. Bratsman, the bronc? And Larry Kane kind of looked around and he 
He said, ask Mr. Macbeth. He's the only man I ever saw ride him. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. All kinds of stories, all kinds of... Yeah. Information on you know some good, some bad, some worthwhile, and some absolutely worthless. But it's all part of life. Most of my information is useless information that I know. Well, I like it, Jimbo. Yeah. All your use, useless information. It ain't useless to us. That's why he's a living legend, y'all. Right. That's sure. Absolutely. He just now told you. He is a living legend, no doubt about it. <laughs> absolutely. Thank y'all. And I'm so glad I got to know him here. Me Absolutely. Too. Me too. For sure. Me too. I don't know. You ask about all those bronc riders, there is a bunch of them. You know, this, one of them was sitting in this room before a while ago. You couldn't, you couldn't throw that guy off if you hit him in the middle of the ride with a Mack truck. <laughs> well, what are you doing these days? What am I doing these days? Well, I've got a little leather shop I piddle around in. Trying to keep things going a little bit. I know you make some dang nice knife sheaths. Uh, I got about a hundred of them. Do you? I don't know. <laughs> I, I bought a whole box of them from I'd him. Probably <laughs> make that many every two weeks. <laughs> he chases his grandkids around. He told me. I asked him why he was in South Texas instead of Kansas. He said my kids are down there. So yep. that answered the question. Well, yeah. there's a little more to it than that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, we appreciate you coming on today, and congratulations on your living legends. Thank you. Thank you much. Appreciate every bit of it. We appreciate you. you. Well, I'll be talking to you soon, I'm sure. Okay. All right, everyone. Get this, your trading britches on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, takes me, he, takes me to, he takes me to town about every time. Only guy I know that takes you. Puts the britches on you. Well, I got to learn a lesson every now and then. I, I got to keep learning just like just like him. Listen to this. <laughs> so he, he takes most, time out of his day to teach me lessons on trading, right, Jimbo. Right, right. Most traders are chronic liars to start with. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's still training. He's still training. He's still yeah. training. <laughs> All right. Thank you, John. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank we'll you, see you all next week. Old stories like long lost friends Rodeos and late night bends History before our time Round pens and pasture rides Cowboys of the Osage